Thank you for the introduction and for the honor of um, inviting me here to tell you about research that my colleagues, I, and many people all over the world have been doing over the past few years, tackling some of the pressing realities of uh, information security and the way we build computer systems. Um, let me start with a bit of motivation, or otherwise uh, doom and gloom proclamations that will motivate the later promise of salvation by snarks. Um, so we have numerous threats to our computer systems. Uh, we have bugs, um, we have random failures, the proverbial cosmic rays, Trojan horses. Um, even when we don't, we're not supposed to have this the way things were designed, uh, there are uh, supply chain issues that uh, can induce this along the way. And each of these applies at the level of user software, at the level of the uh, hardware, at the level of the platform software that's in between, the hypervisor and operating system, and even the physical environment surrounding the computer as a physical device. Each of these um, has numerous examples uh, for the way it can be exploited. Each of the combination in this Cartesian project has made it to uh, papers, news, and exp exploitation in the real world. And moreover, in the most extreme case, we have scenarios when we're not supposed to trust anyone. We might be in a network or untrusted peers that uh, may be uh, adversarial to us in uh, a game theoretic sense or economical sense or national sense. And um, each of these can uh, compromise the uh, integrity, confidentiality, availability of the information produced on these systems. Just to give uh, one example uh, of a, a, a combination of uh, these vectors, the one that we pursue in my lab, consider the matter of extracting information from a computer using physical leakage. The computer is sitting there, maybe executing algorithms that are perfectly secure to the best of our knowledge, and yet it is a physical device that interacts with the environment by emitting electromagnetic waves, by um, a, changing its power consumption, by creating noises, by changing the electric potential on its ground wires, and so on. And each of these can and has been used for extracting secret keys out of computers. It can be uh, by touch of hand to measure electric potential, or by putting uh, an alligator clip on some uh, grounded wire, uh, it can be just by putting a sticker under someone's cell phone and measuring the electromagnetic emanations from its voltage regulator, acoustic emanations measured from across a classroom using a microphone, observing the vibrations of capacitors as some cryptographic operation is running. And uh, conveniently, even uh, small semi-edible implements, that, this, that is a piece of pita bread, that can be used to measure electromagnetic waves and extract secret keys. And when I say extract secret keys, um, well, you may recognize some of these logos. These, uh, these are some of the systems that we successfully attacked. Co very common software, very common hardware. Algorithms such as RSA, elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman, El-Gamal, elliptic curve DSA. All of these have been broken by these means. And this is just one research group and its collaborators. So there's a, there are th thousands of papers showing how more can be done. Switching over to uh, integrity, well, in this case, let me appeal to the popular media that tells us how uh, even the uh, United States Department of Defense cannot fully verify the hardware that it's using to run its critical computations, for example, in the field. And uh, of course, it goes both ways. Uh, we know that the NSA is retaining the favor by uh, adding features to um, a shipments and route to their customers. So how can we ever trust something that comes out of the computer when this is the reality that we face? How do we know that it hasn't leaked? How do we know that it is correct? So taking a step back, we have a great challenge here. And the traditional ways to cope with it are essentially to be very careful. Be uh, very sure about where you buy your hardware, where you subcontract your software. Make sure that everything is carefully certified and, of course, bear the expense of that, which is unbearable. 
So even the uh, NSA, I am told, no longer maintains its old fab. It can no longer produce its old chip, chips. So what, what are uh, small companies supposed to do? What are the citizens supposed to do to protect their information? And what are we all supposed to do in those adversarial environments of network protocols? So I want to make a case uh, that uh, modern cryptography offers us wonderful tools to cope with this problem. Ways by which instead of certifying every component, we can just use the uh, magic of modern cryptography um, to um, somehow get the properties we want a posteriori. And this includes both general tools and theory, studying where um, we can apply these techniques, such techniques, when do they even make sense, when they are possible in principle and under what assumptions, and applications to uh, specific uh, cases where the things are, uh, have a need and uh, if efficient enough for execution. And in this talk, I will focus on the latter for the case of very fine computation. Now, the primitive we will discuss, the pr cryptographic primitive, is called uh, SNARK, for succinct non-interactive argument of knowledge. And we will dwell on the acronym in a bit, but uh, first, very informally, this uh, is a way to um, convince an untrusting party of a computational claim by sending them a proof of that claim that is short and easy to verify. Pictorially, we have a prover and a verifier. There is some computational claim expressed as the claim that some specific function run on some specific input and some additional witness input ex outputs some output y. The claim is that there exists such a witness for which this holds. And instead of just trusting that the claim is true, SNARKs let you produce proofs of its, tr of its truth. Now, we could go both way, two ways. We could uh, drill down into the formalities of these statements, or we can um, just uh, show a definition by example, motivating each of these properties, and that's the track that we'll choose today. So I'm going to motivate the study of SNARKs by uh, a system called zero cash, decentralized anonymous payments from bitcoins, uh, and um, some of you may be aware of it and may also be aware that it's currently being uh, commercialized and deployed. They may be wondering, am I plugging my uh, stake in uh, some company? Well, it's the other way around. The reason that uh, deployment is happening in the first place is that zero cash is a wonderful example of, of the power of snarks, what they're good for, and the properties uh, that uh, are I make them most pertinent to applications. So let's drill in, um, just to uh, avoid any shade of doubt or shadow of doubt, I will uh, uh, stay consistent to the original academic paper. So for those who are familiar with Zcash, the digital currency, um, I will use different notation and simplified constructions. So um, Bitcoin's privacy problem. Uh, I guess everyone here is familiar with Bitcoin, but um, how many of you are aware that whenever you use Bitcoin, you are essentially broadcasting your transactions everywhere? Okay, about a fourth of the audience here. And let's see why Bitcoin actually does that horrible thing and why it's inherent. So in Bitcoin, every uh, coin, every piece of currency is represented by knowledge of a number and payment is represented by sending that number. And that means that the number can be sent over and over to different merchants and they would all accept it. This is called the double spending problem, which is obviously uh, very bad for the, uh, for the currency. So the way this is solved by uh, Satoshi Nakamoto's uh, scheme is um, using the blockchain, a public ledger where every transaction is broadcast in real time. And this makes double spending detection very easy. We just uh, uh, make sure whenever we accept a payment, that the, uh, the source of the funds for, the, for this payment hasn't been used before. And then we broadcast that payment to make sure that others will know that it's already spent. The specifics of this and the assumptions under which it works are somewhat less trivial. But 
Just by saying this, we already see how inherent it is to publish every detail of every transaction, who paid whom and how much. And that means that we've completely lost privacy. Consumers broadcast uh, their purchases, merchants broadcast their cash flow, um, account balances are revealed. Not something that we would accept um, in uh, a regular payment scheme, a regular currency. But uh, with Bitcoin, it has so many other advantages that this uh, uh, seems to have gone uh, unappreciated for a while. Now, uh, those familiar with Bitcoin should object and say that uh, it's not people's names that's written there, it's only pseudonyms or keys that they can invent. But um, in practice, most users, especially those that have nothing to uh, hide, uh, use few addresses and therefore are easy to track. And there are numerous works showing how the, the transaction graph can be analyzed to extract information. It's also a risk to the fungibility of the currency, the fact, the fact that coins can be distinguished and their history can be told, meaning they may assign different value, which undermines another fundamental tenant of currencies. So zero cash, the scheme that I'll sketch, is a privacy preserving protocol that uh, provides all of the uh, functionality of Bitcoin. But if you look at the blockchain, what you see is a bunch of meaningless values. Random numbers, ciphertexts, and zero knowledge proofs that we'll get to in a second that reveal nothing. And someone standing on the side, the third party, knows nothing about who paid whom and how much in every individual transaction. Only those involved in the transaction know these details. And of course, and essentially, they know that it's legit. And um, jumping ahead, but just to set the stage, uh, the system is practical. Uh, proofs are a few hundred bytes long. They take a few milliseconds to verify and less than a minute on a typical computer to create. There are some system parameters that are a bit annoying but practical. Everything works out. There is a trust assumption that uh, is needed in order to create uh, those system parameters, the public parameters. I will discuss that later. Uh, and there are cryptographic assumptions. So uh, the, the underlying uh, cryptographic scheme, namely the SNARK, will require some computational assumptions uh, about how simple, some specific simple problems uh, are hard to solve, and from that the security of the whole system follows. Now, why do I even mention zero cash, and uh, what does it have to do with SNARKs? So here's a cartoon version of the scheme. Um, and I'll start by a series of very simple constructions, uh, starting with a very silly one, uh, then getting to uh, one that's uh, actually secure, but, uh, very, but doesn't have much functionality. And then uh, I'll, get, I'll give a glimpse into what the full thing looks like. Along the way, we'll appreciate the needed properties of SNARKs. So here's the scenario. Uh, we look at a specific transaction, and there's a uh, seller and a merchant, a seller, the mer sorry, uh, a, a consumer and a merchant. The consumer wants to transfer 42 bitcoins to the merchant. So uh, he just tells the merchant, the merchant, here are 42 bitcoins represented uh, as some number. And the merchant looks at that and has no idea whether that number is OK or not. Uh, it, it, the, the legitimacy of that number relates to how it, uh, it, it connects to previous transactions. Is it a correct withdrawal of funds from a prior transaction? Now, the consumer knows that information. So they could just set, send that information about where they got the money to the merchant for the merchant to verify. And that's essentially what happens in bitcoins. In Bitcoin, that loses privacy, and we don't want that. Well, imagine instead if we could somehow bring in a magical accountant that would look at uh, the consumer's books and verify them and make sure that uh, the money is correctly transferred into this payment. And then the accountant would send a signature to the merchant. Well, if the accountant is available and trusted, then that's satisfactory. And, if, um, and it needs to be trusted both by the merchant uh, that it doesn't uh, uh, falsely sign and by the consumer that it doesn't leak the information. These are big assumptions. It's very awkward. Um, so let's see if we, we can somehow emulate this digitally. 
So the key point is that this account that has an algorithm that he's supposed to run. And once we are in the realm of algorithms and computations, then we can, cre we can create proofs that the algorithm ran correctly, and that will substitute for the physical accountant. And let's see what properties we need for this proof to, um, a, to a, give the a properties needed by the surrounding crypto system. And sorry, by the surrounding cryptocurrency in our setting. So uh, let's generalize this just to avoid speaking uh, more about uh, accountants and, uh, and books. What we have here is some form of NP statement of the form we showed before. And uh, there's an NP witness, and there's an NP decision algorithm. And we want this system for producing the proof to actually be a proof system in the sense of providing soundness. We're going to relax this to computational soundness, namely soundness against any cheating prover that is computationally bounded, asymptotically runs in polynomial time, concretely bounded by some uh, specific running time under well-accepted cryptographic hardness assumptions. So the nickname for computationally sound proofs is arguments. So we're going to use that. The next property we want is for the proof to be non-interactive. Uh, surely we don't want too much back and forth, but in this case, in the context of a cryptocurrency, these proofs are going to end up on, on the public ledger, on the blockchain, and other people are going to check them. And a poor consumer can't interact with everyone into the future going forward. So it must be something that you can write down non-interactively. Next, uh, it must be what's called a proof of knowledge, uh, meaning that um, it's not just that there exists a, a witness for the NP statement, but the consumer actually knows it. It's not just that there could have been transactions leading to this payment, but the uh, consumer actually knows the, those transactions and the corresponding secret keys that are embedded uh, a, a, into them as proof of his ownership of the coin. This is a somewhat technical condition, but it's essential, and uh, that's why we add a proof of knowledge pro uh, requirement. Uh, more uh, immediately, we want succinctness, and in the sense of uh, short proofs and easy verification. That's important because they, they end up on the blockchain, and everybody has to verify them to make that the blockchain is correct, if they want to be really convinced. And conveniently enough, if you take this sort of acronym, what you get is SNARK. And uh, these are the essential properties. There is one more property, which is uh, zero knowledge. And that's the property that uh, de defends our consumer from leakage of his secrets. Because it could have been that uh, these proofs actually leak everything that is dear to the uh, consumer's privacy. Maybe uh, the proof is simply a copy of those books, right? That would be sound. Um, so we want the zero knowledge property that says it doesn't happen. The formal definition is uh, counterintuitive on the first dozen times you hear it. But uh, essentially it says that uh, anything the uh, verifier, the merchant, could have learned, uh, sorry, everything he learns from the proof, he could have learned just by uh, emulating the proof using the information it already has. So uh, zero knowledge snarks. That's what we're after, ZK snarks. And there's quite a few of them in the literature. Um, if you look back, the term snark is uh, modern, but uh, the variants of this and precursors have been studied for several decades. And um, it started with um, questions about uh, a fundam a fundamental properties of computation uh, in, in the theoretical sense. Uh, can computations be summarized into short proofs in principle? Um, it uh, strongly relates to probabilistically checkable proofs, or, uh, motivated until recently mostly by uh, uh, hardness results in uh, theoretical computer science. And yet, uh, all of those uh, a, a older type of snarks or precursor to snarks 
um, they follow the certain pattern, which uh, is basically taking probabilistically checkable proofs and then applying some lightweight cryptography to compress them. This, uh, unfortunately, wasn't very efficient, just because those uh, probabilistically checkable proofs, while polynomial time, which is a marvelous theoretical discovery, um, are too slow in practice. Um, the ex for a long time, it was polynomial in the sense of n to the 17. Uh, now we know how to get it down to polylogarithmic, but the concrete numbers are still not conducive to the kind of applications I show. But much more recently, there's a crop of new SNARKs that uh, have a trade-off. They introduce some pre-processing or common reference string that is created in advance. And in exchange for that, they are much more efficient. And uh, these are the ones that uh, are used by uh, zero cash and uh, by most other applications. So let's uh, look how these are used for uh, used in zero cash. So suppose you have such a snark, and um, you want to create a cryptocurrency. Well, the first thing you, you think to do is to just issue tokens. Give people random numbers and say uh, your knowledge of the random number represents uh, a, a, your ownership of some unit of currency. And uh, in order to mint, to, to create a new and a random number, you prove that you, uh, a, a, you spent some resources, say, put into uh, escrow some Bitcoin, and then you get a serial number. And all of these serial numbers are, are public, and then when you want to withdraw uh, or to spend such a coin, you would uh, just publish a serial number and say, hey, uh, this is a serial number that is in the public ledger. Uh, I'm entitled to something in return, right? This would be the spending event. Unfortunately, this is very insecure because everybody sees those numbers, so everybody can say, okay, that one's mine, that one's mine, and get, uh, and get to spend other people's money. So we can't do that. Uh, here's a, a very nice idea by Sander and Tashma um, that fixes the, the first problem. And the idea is to use a cryptographic commitment scheme, um, a function that has two inputs, in our case, the serial number and the commitment randomness. It produces a commitment value for the coin. Um, and uh, if you haven't seen this before, just imagine it's a very random looking hash function that heuristically would do. And the way that we issue coins now is by saying uh, I've, I'm entitled to a new coin uh, because uh, I, I uh, gave something in return. And um, here is my coin commitment for that coin. Under the hood, what I did is I uh, came up with a serial number and uh, a commitment randomness, ran them through the commitment function, and I got the commitment value for the coin, which I published. And what, what goes on the blockchain is just those commitment values. So you see, there's some notation here in uh, color coding. Uh, the brown stuff is what I keep in my private wallet. That's proof of my ownership. And um, the uh, blue stuff is what's in the public ledger. Now, when the day comes to spend the coin, I'm going to say, hey, everybody, I am now going to use one of those coins whose commitments is in the ledger. So uh, here's the serial number of the coin, here's the randomness, and here's the commitment. You can make sure that the commitment is in the ledger, and you can make sure that uh, if you plug serial number and randomness into the function, you get the claimed value. OK, very elegant. But there's still a problem here. And that's that uh, I've just revealed the relation between my spending event and the minting event. Because this uh, commitment value in the spending event can be linked to the time where the, the same value was added to the ledger. So that breaks privacy. That means that someone who observes the, the transactions can link the spending and the minting. But now, we are in a better shape to uh, use zero knowledge proofs. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to build a hash of a, a to run the hash a, on, I'm sorry, I'm a bit safety deprived. We're going to uh, use a hash function to build a Merkle hash tree over all of these commitments. And um, for those who haven't seen this, you just uh, take pairs and apply the hash function recursively to get the root. 
And this uh, it forms a commitment to the value of everything in the ledger. Now, the, so far, the, everything is public. Now, in order to spend a value, to spend the coin, I reveal its serial number, and I want to convince everyone that I know the R and CM that match um, the serial number without revealing the CM. But this is, um, this is something that uh, we can express as an algorithm. Uh, the, the fact that a given CM is in a tree whose root is given is something that we can write a, a, an algorithm to verify. And actually, because uh, it's a tree structure, we can verify it very efficiently in size logarithmic in the, in, the, in the number of commitments so far. So we end up with a statement saying that the commitment is in the tree and it matches the R and the S. And this statement we can verify in zero knowledge. Um, and, uh, that would, uh, and, and that would give us the requisite properties. Let's have one more run over the properties of the SNARKs to make sure that we got them right. We need soundness. We need it to be non-interactive. We need uh, zero knowledge to protect CM. That gives us privacy. Uh, we need of, of knowledge because of the uh, computational hardness of finding collisions in, in the hash function. That's the technical condition. And we need a sickness for efficiency. Okay, so this is the cartoon version of how we use SNARKs in a zero cache like protocol. But now that we're here, we have the power of general NP statements. And with great power comes great functionality. Because now we can extend this uh, tuple of value and relations between them to add additional values and additional relations to get more out of our cryptocurrency. For example, we can add uh, a denomination or value to every coin. So coins will not all have equal va value uh, economically, but uh, people can hold a, a different coins of different denomination. It's clearly needed. And to do that, we augmented the data structure with some additional values. I will not go into the details. We also change the zero knowledge proof to check those values. If we want to enable direct transfers of payments between people, then we need additional machinery. We need to be able to somehow encode a coin in a way that can be decoded only by designated recipients, and then have the recipient know that this coin is addressed to him. So, and only that recipient can then uh, continue using that coin for a subsequent transaction. Um, and that requires some... Um, a, a, keys to identify people. Every user would have a private key and a public key, and these keys go into a much larger tuple with additional relations. We won't go into the details. They are, they, you can find them all in the zero cache paper and the uh, subsequent evolution in the Zcash specification. Let me just say that everything here can be abstracted into a transaction that subsumes uh, all the things that need, need to be done in a Bitcoin-like uh, digital currency. We call this uh, the poor transaction in the paper. Uh, it consumes two old zero, ca zero cash coins, and it uh, creates or mints two new zero cash coins. And it also uh, can withdraw some of, the, of that hidden money into public Bitcoins. That's uh, in case you need to pay transaction fees and such. And then uh, it also gets instructions on how much value to send to each, uh, to each output coin uh, in, uh, using the extended scheme that we, we've just seen, uh, uh, glimpsed that lets us address coins to specific people and how much to send them. And uh, the results fulfill the instructions. And then everything gets packed into something that goes on the blockchain, consisting of the, the, the serial numbers of the consumed coins to tell everybody, hey, these are consumed. If you ever see these serial numbers again, this, this, uh, then disregard them. This is a double spend attempt. Um, there's uh, the commitments of the new coins. And there's a zero knowledge proof that everything held. And in particular, that uh, the sum of the old coins is consistent with the sum of the newly produced coins. 
So this is a non-trivial system. Actually implementing this uh, is a long exercise. It starts with an implementation of the SNARK using libsnark, a library that we developed. Uh, then we have to um, create uh, the specific uh, tuples and relations for, uh, a, for zero cache and uh, express our computation that uh, a, a function that checks Merkle trees and sums and so forth. We need to express them in a particular language of constraints that Libsnark can consume. Um, all of this is encapsulated into a library and then uh, there is uh, a, a variant of Bitcoin that uh, integrates the old Bitcoin, co Bitcoin code called Bitcoin D uh, with lib zero cache. And uh, in the academic paper, we had a network simulation showing that everything can run with adequate parameters and efficiency to support something that is Bitcoin scale. Uh, nowadays, uh, we actually have a test network with thousands of users worldwide who are using the, the uh, evolution of this architecture and uh, it's, uh, it, it uh, supports uh, the uh, efficiency requirements and in terms of security, well, so far so good. Uh, I should mention the obvious, um, all of this is uh, very carefully analyzed. Uh, what I've just sketched here in, uh, in the paper and, and spec uh, is very precisely specified up to the last bit and uh, there are the security properties are precisely defined and proven. So, um, I was hoping to say something about uh, how SNARKs are constructed, uh, but it doesn't look like the time constraints will allow that. So let me just um, say one thing that uh, is important to know in some applications, uh, zero cache is one of them, and then say a few words about where SNARKs come from in the grand scheme of things uh, and techniques. So we are in the NP setting uh, and we want SNARKs to look like this. Um, sorry, that's redundant, okay. But actually, they look like this. In order to uh, use the uh, most efficient SNARKs available, those on the bottom left of the, of the uh, preceding slide, um, we need the, to create those system parameters or public parameters. Um, that's something essential to the way the scheme works. It, uh, you can think about the, those parameters as um, sort of building a template of what the computation should look like in encrypted form. And then uh, the actual proof shows that a particular claim and witness fall into that template. So the computation in, uh, of the template takes roughly as long as, as proving, um, and, uh, which is much, much slower than uh, the native computation. Um, I, I, I should have mentioned this before. Proving is much, much slower than native computation. For example, the SNARK for zero cache take about a minute to uh, produce a proof for, whereas if you just blindly trusted the consumer, it would uh, take a, a fraction of a millisecond. But back here, so there's the generator, and the generator produces keys, a proving key and a verifying key that will be used by the parties later. So uh, you have to take care of this uh, generation. You have to do it in a secure way. Um, for example, in zero cache, uh, uh, this is a big deal they, because uh, any compromise of those uh, proving keys could lead to a counterfeiting of coins. So uh, there was actually a very complicated cryptographic ceremony done uh, with a multi-party computation involving multiple nodes that uh, uh, participate in order to create those uh, keys and the guarantee is that if even at least one of them is honest and deletes his transient secrets, then the result is safe to use and uh, the soundness of the snark holds. That's one way to approach it. There are also many other variants of snarks that I will not go into besides this question of uh, whether the public parameters exist or not. Uh, they may or may not depend on the choice of function, it be expensive or cheap. Um, there's a question of who can verify the snarks or not. We're going to, uh, for now, focus on the particular most natural 
a, a definition of snark, which is exactly what you would expect from the applications, except that it does have the trusted setup, which is something we have to manage. Now, these uh, snarks have evolved marvelously uh, since uh, their inception uh, in 2010 by a wonderful paper by Jens Groth. He first showed how preprocessing snarks can be built and, and how they uh, improve certain parameters, most strikingly succinctness. Uh, and um, without even going into the specifics, you can see that there has been a lot of progress. Um, the particular snark that is uh, most popular nowadays because it gives the best trade-off, the one using uh, libsnark, is the, based on uh, papers by GGPR and PGHR and their reinterpretations re and tweaks, uh, including by, by us. And uh, uh, the striking thing is that uh, it, the proofs for this snark are just seven or eight field elements uh, where the field is uh, that of your typical elliptic curve. So a few hundred bytes. Now, showing how this works is something that I would have loved to do here. Uh, time did not allow. Let me give you that promised glimpse. The way all of these preprocessing snarks work is they start with an algebraic part where they take the witness and encode it into a form that can be probabilistically checked. A form where if someone actually wrote it down and you could query it, then you could very easily make sure that the witness is a correct witness for the claim statement. And moreover, um, the, uh, those queries are all linear functions. So the witness is encoded into, um, a, into a string, then a few linear queries are done by, by computing linear combinations of the string. And then with overwhelming probability, um, whenever the, uh, some equations hold on the results of these the queries, the, uh, cl the computational claim is correct. But the problem is that uh, we don't, the, this encoding is too big. It's bigger than the witness. So we don't want the uh, prover to send it over. And this is where cryptography comes into the picture. We use cryptographic tools to first encode the queries so the adversaries uh, can keep the encoded witness, the, the adversary being the cheating prover, can keep the encoded uh, witness to himself. And when he gets the, the queries in encrypted form, they don't know what's being asked. And therefore, they can't try to fool the verifier in how he answers. So uh, we use encrypted queries uh, to prevent uh, a adaptively, adaptive choice of, the, of a false witness or false encoded witness. And then moreover, remember that the algebraic part uh, needed linear queries, and uh, we're going to force queries to be linear by uh, using some additional properties of the um, encryption scheme. And lastly, because uh, the queries are encrypted, necessarily the, uh, the answers to the queries from the prover to the verifier are also encrypted. And that means that it, uh, no one else can check them. So uh, we're going to use uh, pairings on elliptic curves, uh, for which we are grateful to Dan, to let anyone publicly verify the requisite relations. How are we doing on time? Sorry? Okay. Uh, this is what it looks like at the end of the day. If you uh, shed away all pretense of abstraction and uh, use a few uh, convenient functions, um, it ends up being uh, a lot of uh, field arithmetic, uh, expressing uh, low degree extensions and evaluations of polynomials on the algebraic part and expressing uh, that special encryption scheme on the cryptographic part. Um, so that's uh, that slide and many more um, uh, results are actually implemented nowadays in running code. We are no longer in the realm of theory. Uh, we have implementations from uh, Microsoft, uh, the Pinocchio and Geppetto system, Microsoft and co-authors. We have LibSnark uh, by my co-authors and me uh, in a virtual lab we call Skipper Lab for 
uh, succinct private, uh, succinct, oh my, uh, succinct computational integrity and privacy. Um, and uh, there's even someone who uh, took uh, libsnark and re-implemented it in a different dialect of C++ and called it snarklib. Um, and uh, these are just the cryptographic backends. This is, uh, these things consume a low level representation of uh, the circuits you want and apply various uh, snarks to it. Libsnark supports uh, four or five uh, snarks by now of this form in several more extended forms. Now, I would be happy to, but, uh, sorry? Oh, to be Oh dear, that is a, well then, uh, it, it, the uh, slide obliges. Um, this is um, copy and paste it from a tutorial. For sufficiently large value of tomorrow. So um, there, are, um, there are also uh, various ways to create those programs, those functions, those uh, constraints that we need in order to use the SNARKs. We talked about verifying Merkle trees and sums. Uh, how is that expressed? For the SNARKs, it's expressed as some uh, bilinear constraints over variables. You can think about it as something very close to arithmetic circuit representation. But um, you don't want such low level representations um, like the underlying quadratic arithmetic programs or the arithmetic circuits. We prefer something more humane like uh, Boolean circuits. You want to claim that some Boolean circuit uh, accepts some inputs. Or C programs, even better. We want to say that a C program executed on some uh, input and, uh, that, that we decide and some other input that uh, we know but don't reveal outputs some output. That we, so the claim is about the function, the input that we decided, and the output, um, and it expresses the fact that the C program uh, has, that, has that, uh, that property according to the C language semantics. That would be convenient for programmers, but it's a far cry from arithmetic circuits. And of course, ideally, we would want uh, to represent high-level high things like a monetary transaction is correct according to someone's financial records. So this would be, of course, a chain of reductions. We have essentially covered this reduction and um, I want to tell you uh, a little bit about how, uh, about what we did uh, to get from here to that and from here to that. Um, so let's talk about uh, SNARKs for general C programs. Uh, this is a, the, the progress over time. It start with, uh, starts with uh, theoretical feasibility results and uh, fast forward many papers, we now uh, have a SNARKs for general C program uh, of any size and they can run for any amount of time and uh, we can even have them uh, talk to each other in the distributed computation that I'll, I'll discuss later and uh, it's easy to verify the results of that C program regardless of its size and running time um, and this is actually um, implemented in uh, working prototypes. Uh, the one thing that I did not dare check is uh, the question of fast proving because there is many orders of magnitude slowdown in this case as well. In this case due to both the uh, underlying snark and the reduction from C programs. Now the implementation of this is uh, a non-trivial affair that was by itself a project that started with interesting theory questions and culminated in working systems. Um, the bottom line is that the correct ex execution of any C program can be verified in a few milliseconds and in a few hundred bytes. Um, and it, getting this creates uh, many questions. The biggest one of this is how to uh, how to handle uh, variable control flow and random access memory. Because if you had just a straight line program with no random access, 
you could just go instruction by instruction or statement by statement and translate it into arithmetic circuits. That's the approach that uh, other systems like Pinocchio and Geppetto took. That can be a fairly tight reduction. It's, it's a great way to do things for that class of programs. But once you have random access memory, what do you do? The, the expressing them as huge multiplexers uh, will be horribly inefficient. What about uh, a conditional jumps, loop, and so forth? So the way we tackle the problem is um, by uh, creating a compiler from C programs into assembly code of a new virtual uh, processor that we defined called TinyRAM. And uh, then we built uh, circuits, arithmetic circuits, that uh, implement a, a, a TinyRAM interpreter. Uh, conceptually similar to what you would do in a VHDL design for a new processor. And then we finish the reduction all the way down to the SNARKs. Um, the compiler is, use, is built on GCC using a new GCC architecture, uh, and it supports uh, all the standard functionality of C. Uh, not all the libraries, because some of them talk about uh, things uh, that are outside our, our machine model, but all language constructs are supported. Uh, this is the specification of the, uh, uh, of the processor. It has just the bare essentials, and it strikes a good trade-off between efficient compilation and running time in terms of uh, virtual cycles on one hand, and the reduction from um, um, uh, the uh, circuit, the, sorry, from the uh, specification of the processor to, a, to an arithmetic circuit. Uh, we don't have a SHA-256, but it is a natural uh, extension, yes. You could add uh, a accelerators. Yeah. Um, let me skip that due to the time, uh, but as you can glimpse, that's non-trivial architecture too. Um, and the, the um, theoretical heart of the matter is a way to take uh, uh, those random accesses and somehow route them on a permutation network in order to uh, e express them as an arithmetic circuit with just local constraints. But that's tomorrow. Uh, what I would like to mention in the few remaining minutes is the generalization of SNARKs to distributed computation. Because just one node isn't enough, and part of our motivation was the fact that uh, people talk to each other on and on. And um, zero cache uh, as a distributed network sort of glues together vanilla snarks uh, using a blockchain to make sure that everybody has verified all the previous snarks. But we could actually do this directly without a blockchain and get many of the properties, though not all. The idea is uh, what we call proof carrying data. You have a distributed computation consisting of nodes producing and consuming inputs on a directed acyclic graph of computation, and uh, they don't trust each other at all. Right, that's, that's the assumption we would like to make, the worst case. Um, and uh, our goal is not to bother make sure, making sure that uh, they were all purchased at verified suppliers, but rather to make sure that they all produce the right result. This is what we really care about. So we're going to augment every message with a proof that this message complies with the prescribed policy of the system. And the messages uh, can be verified locally. Um, and moreover, um, every message attests that all of the history complies as well. So you don't, have to, you don't ever have to go back. So just checking these proofs tells me that this is the result of a long computation, all of whose steps are compliant. Now, what do I mean by compliant, right? That's a strange word. And by compliant, I mean that there is a precise functional specification um, that says uh, a, what relations between inputs, outputs, and optional additional inputs is allowed. There is a predicate, a compliance predicate expressed in your favorite language, C, circuits, whatever. And uh, a, it, it tells you what it means for something to be locally compliant. And then once you've decided on the compliance predicate, uh, we say that every node is compliant if it fulfills that predicate. 
a distributed computation is compliant if it all nodes fulfill the predicate, and the output is compliant if it's output of some distributed computation that is compliant. So the first thing to, uh, to say is, uh, uh, yes, we can do that. We can actually build PCD, and LibSnark actually implements it. And establishing under what conditions it actually exists is another line of theoretical research that we'll discuss tomorrow. Um, and the other question is, what is it good for? And there are many interesting examples. Like I can say, within my network, within, within my organization, only specific programs can run. And I want proofs of that, that every value that passes between nodes is, there, is compliant in that sense. Or my, my nodes are only allowed to run programs signed by the sysadmin. Um, I can use this uh, for MapReduce applications for cluster computing, a prototype that we build, having a very fully verified MapReduce that uh, tells you that the result of some big computation whose input there is a commitment to are the claimed ones. Think about uh, some huge query on a medical database. You want to trust the result. You want a proof. But there's also a matter of privacy. So the proof is your knowledge. And it reveals nothing about the values except that they were on the correct database as summarized in some hash commitment. Another system that we built using PCD uh, is uh, for authentication, uh, authentication of uh, images, photographic images. You want to show that a, an image is authentic, indeed captured by a camera. And you want to um, allow some transformations to happen. Maybe this is a dating website. So people are allowed to edit their images by cropping the messy bedroom behind them, but they must not, heaven forbid, change the aspect ratio. So how can we express that and enforce that? It turns out that this has been an open problem for uh, more than a decade with uh, a, about a dozen papers coming mainly from the image processing community who try to tackle this by various ad hoc techniques. The system we built called PhotoProof uses cryptographic to, uh, tools to solve the problem generically. Um, once the signing key is embedded in the camera, we can say that uh, whenever you uh, edit an image, uh, you'd create a proof that you correctly edited the image, that is, uh, you uh, complied with the list of allowed image transformations. And moreover, you edited an image that is self-compliant in the same sense. And then the final viewer can verify the result. Final verification is very lightweight. And uh, while editing, you would need to create proofs on the fly in this chain structure. Whereas as soon as you try to, to, uh, make, to claim a false statement, for example, claim authenticity of something that was airbrushed, you would never be able to produce a convincing proof. So conceptually, think of JPEG images on Facebook or with dating websites as having an extra EXIF header giving the snark proof that these are compliant with the site's policy. And one last uh, ongoing project, uh, and uh, I want to finish with this one because I think it really drives in the uh, conceptual transition that I'm advocating. Um, many of you have, must have seen those uh, logic kits where you get uh, a, an end gate as a box and an OR gate as a box and you can build circuits and that's a great way to teach students or kids um, the, the basics of logical circuits. Um, so uh, the problem with that is that is you cannot trust the result and unfortunately that problem applies not just to those toy kits but also to the state-of-the-art VLSI technology. You're supposed to trust the manufacturer and hope for the best. We've seen uh, recent fascinating papers about uh, IC trojans and how a, a few errant dopant atoms in the wrong transistors can create a trojan horse. So good luck verifying that. But imagine instead that you don't care about performance at all. And moreover, that you could uh, create um, a, this kind of authenticated logic gates that you can wire together. You tell them, uh, hey, uh, you, you should do a secure end and uh, you should do a secure end. And you let them run software 
which implements the proof carrying data for the compliance predicate that enforces that circuit. So um, the compliance would say that at every point in time, uh, the evolution of this circuit, which can have cycles and state, the evolution of this circuit maintains the invariant that every gate operated correctly and moreover operated on the inputs given by other gates who also operated correctly with respect to some specific input uh, given to the input gates of the circuit. Uh, so this, uh, this actually works. It's grossly inefficient because every gate is implemented by a cell phone in this prototype. But, um, but, but it uh, clarifies the basic concept that we can do authenticated computation. We can trust result of, results of computation. We are haggling over the price, but this is the most general thing you can imagine. This is by, uh, the citation is missing. This is very new, uh, ongoing work with my student Gilad Roth. Um, so the, uh, the on this brand of cell phones, it takes a, on the order of a minute for a for, of propagation delay, so to speak. Uh, yeah, that's a strange unit for propagation delay. Um, but uh, it scales in the sense that uh, if you did it by hand, then at some point in time you'd uh, you need to get to grab some food uh, or uh, run out of your lifespan, whereas this can compute indefinitely. And we expect the constants to improve. So some discussion. Uh, clearly, we wanted to improve performance. Uh, we want to beat the do it by hand barrier. Um, for um, but this is the most extreme case that we ever built, doing the whole snark proof per gate. Uh, that, that's, that's a huge overhead. For particular applications where we really care about performance, like zero cache, we strip away many layers of abstractions and tailor things, and then the overheads are a few orders of magnitude compared to native execution, which may be worth it when you have no alternative. There is no other known way to create, for example, cryptocurrencies or authentication schemes with the claimed properties. We want to get rid of the uh, pre-processing and trusted setup that I alluded to. Um, we would love to go back to the old schemes that uh, don't have it. And we are actively working on in the lab. We have a prototype that implements that schemes. And we have a, an implementation of TinyRAM and the C compiler for that implementation as well without trusted processing. Unfortunately, performance is still far from the state of the art pre-processing snarks. Yeah, uh, some two weeks, but yeah. Um, then uh, we, we are eagerly looking for applications. Um, I mentioned just a few. There are actually by now, uh, I think, uh, over 10 research groups worldwide that use LeapSnack for all sorts of applications. Uh, many of them are in the cryptocurrency arena, but, uh, but uh, doing different things than adding privacy. Uh, in, in, in the sense I described. Um, some are completely different, and um, uh, this is very exciting uh, to uh, be part of facilitating uh, a, such a deluge of uh, fascinating research. And um, lastly, um, uh, we want to help users build those applications, which raises very interesting questions in the realm of uh, programming languages uh, for expressing statements, they behave strangely compared to traditional computation. For example, in a certain sense, you get non-deterministic advice for free, but you still can trust it. Uh, and the bilinear operations are, uh, are the basic ingredients, so linear combinations are for free, and you want to optimize for that. Uh, so there are good questions there. Um, there is the crucial question of being sure that the statements that we prove, the compliance predicates that, that, whoops, that we verify are actually uh, correct in the sense that they have the properties we think they do. And that's a question for the uh, formal analysis uh, people among us. And uh, there are questions of how to uh, integrate this power and this expressive power into larger systems uh, built in the old school, just uh, trust the node the paradigm um, and in this uh, direction, there is ongoing work um, 
where we look at uh, verifying the, that Java classes, for example, have the correct uh, provenance according to the Java semantics, uh, which is something that you cannot trust if you just import them from a network. Um, so I, th I hope that I've made the case that uh, SNARKs are a, a, a paradigm shift uh, in uh, s security, at least in, th in those scenarios where they are sufficiently practical. And I hope to uh, enlist you to the effort to improve and use them. Thank you. I'll be happy to take questions. So, so uh, we have to ask about the ceremony that was used in the process setup for Zcash. Can you say a little bit about how, how that was done? Um, so uh, many details are forthcoming, and uh, um, the first of which should appear today, I believe. Uh, at the broad level, there was a committee. Um, each um, user, um, each participant in the committee uh, was a reputable party, so uh, it would be extremely surprising if all of them uh, colluded in, um, in, in keeping secrets that they should not. So that's the first line of defense. And of course, they could have been just hacked uh, by uh, all those vulnerabilities we enumerated at the very beginning. So we took very extreme OPSEC measures uh, at each of these sites in order to uh, have, a, for example, an air gap between the secrets and anything else, keep uh, append-only logs of every individual transaction, uh, verify the code in uh, every way that was feasible, and so forth. And um, all the details of that, uh, including the code, including those logs, and uh, the participant statements will be fully published. Has the FBI come to you yet and said this is too good and they want to back door it? <laughs> so um, backdooring Zcash in uh, in in uh, in this scheme and with in the uh, scenario that uh, was constructed and documented and will be reviewed is not something that I would know how to do. Uh, all the proofs say that uh, under certain assumptions it's it's infeasible. And uh, the, I hope that the uh, OPSEC um, in the, of the ceremony will convince people that those assumptions were fulfilled. Um, can you talk about the what overlap there's been so far between the verifiable computation line of research and quantum crypto? Because I've kind of heard zero the relation between quantum computing and verifiable computation. That's like Batman versus Superman, right? Uh, well, uh, to spoil the fun, uh, uh, the battle would end very quickly in the sense that uh, at the moment we do not have any snarks that are quantum resistant. Um, earlier, I alluded uh, to uh, cryptographic properties that we require from that encryption scheme used to encrypt the queries in the SNARK. Um, the only scheme that uh, um, that we know of that um, uh, has these properties uh, is based on uh, discrete log. Um, and let me actually change my statement. There is no efficient SNARK of the preprocessing kind that is quantum resistant. If you go back to those uh, old school uh, SNARKs proposed by uh, Silvio Michali and uh, Kilian, uh, they uh, rely just on uh, probabilistically checkable proofs, which are, is provable uh, algebraic properties under no assumptions. And uh, in, if you believe in random oracles, if you believe in very random functions, uh, they can be quantum resistant, which I think everyone does, then, um, then that's all it needs. Um, if you don't, then uh, there is a more precise characterization of what's needed in the form of extractable collision resistant hashes. Um, and there, um, we have the, a better theoretical understanding but actually, I'm not sure what's the state of the art about post-quantum extractable collision resistant hashes. That's a great question. How do you prevent double spending? 
Uh, are you claiming that you can prevent double spending without multiple confirmations? Um, so the uh, double spending mechanism uh, in zero cash has similar properties to that of Bitcoin in the sense that uh, whenever um, the output of the transaction is consumed and should never be consumed again, um, this is written in the ledger. It's written in a different way. In our case, it would be the serial number, right? Um, but uh, once it's written, everyone who sees that ledger will know that it's a double spend. So the remaining question is, does everyone see the same ledger, which is the question of the distributed consensus layer of, uh, of Bitcoin, and that is nearly orthogonal to the one we've been discussing. Okay, so basically there's no improvement over Bitcoin in that area? There is none. Okay. I mean, it's, it's worth pointing out that even if the setup was problematic, uh, you would have problems with uh, coins being um, double spent and things like that, but privacy would not be hurt. Right, that's, that's an important point. Thank you, Dan. Um, the uh, trusted setup is required to ensuring the soundness of the snark, hence the f that coins will not be uh, counterfeited. And we saw in the scheme where that comes in, if someone could convince you for st false statement, uh, they could withdraw a commitment that, uh, that is not really in the, in the ledger in Merkle tree. However, the zero knowledge property is unconditional. Uh, this is what's called statistical zero knowledge. Basically, all the, uh, that the zero knowledge proof contains, all that people can see on the ledger, is a bunch of values that are completely random conditioned on that that they are a correct proof. So there's no further information to learn except that the proof is correct. Isn't that an answer to my question? Uh, you could backdoor the, uh, the setup process, presumably. So if uh, a three-later agency were interested in violating the uh, privacy of users rather than stealing all their money, uh, then the proofs say they can't do that. Also, if the initialization <coughs> process was backdoored, you wouldn't be able to detect it because there isn't enough information in the public ledger to do that. Right. The uh, verification of the, uh, of the trusted setup ceremony is completely independent of the ledger. Uh, we use uh, old school mechanisms to convince people of what went on, like uh, having uh, a, a surveillance cameras at the uh, nodes that participated in the ceremony running around the clock. Uh, we're having journalists on site reviewing everything, taking uh, hash chains of uh, everything that goes on and uh, posting them on uh, Twitter, as some of you may have noticed. Um, and um, yes, these are out of band channels, but uh, in, in conjunction, they would be extremely hard to fake. Did you use photo proof on the surveillance camera? <laughs> <laughs> Next up. Two hundred and eighty-eight bytes and a verification proof. Uh, what kind of processor? Um, so the size of the proof is independent of the processor. Um, it's just uh, those seven or eight field elements that I mentioned earlier. Uh, it's only a function of uh, which uh, snack construction you use and. Uh, what security parameters you choose in terms of uh, the assumptions on the hardness of discrete log in the underlying curve and so forth. No, I understand that, but I'm just going to come up with a specific number like that. It must have been a specific process. Okay, so the number that does require that is the running time. So the numbers I gave were um, uh, for different architectures. Um, let's see, for, the, um, for, for zero cache, creating the proof, uh, it takes under a minute on a typical desktop CPU. Um, and uh, for the um, you for for the variant of tiny RAM uh, that uh, can run forever without without a, a memory blow up that uh, best case on the on the bottom line. Uh, there is, in the, the performance is about uh, one tenth of a hertz, one cycle, one cycle every ten minutes. Sorry, every ten seconds on a uh, typical server processor. Um, 
for the even more extreme, more wasteful version uh, of using cell phones. Uh, those were Meizu MX-5 phones. Um, but the bottom line is uh, that when the computation is simple enough, when you've managed to um, distill your security property into a small, simple specification, as in zero cache, um, then the running times are typically on the order of seconds uh, or minutes on a regular processors. Uh, if you do something uh, with high, higher level of abstraction, you lose orders of magnitude. And if you do something that uh, is a more heavyweight in the input size, like uh, the image processing of photoproof, uh, then you would, uh, uh, the running time would be commensurate to that. But for photoproof for small images, it is on the order of minutes or tens of minutes. That's something you'd run in the background. I'll be happy to give more specific numbers for any specific scenario. Okay. here. And let's see why Bitcoin actually does that horrible thing and why it's inherent. So in Bitcoin, every uh, coin, every piece of currency is represented by knowledge of a number and payment is represented by sending that number. And that means that the number can be sent over and over to different merchants and they would all accept it. This is called the double spending problem, which is obviously uh, very bad for the, uh, for the currency. So the way this is solved by uh, Satoshi Nakamoto's uh, scheme is um, using the blockchain, a public ledger where every transaction is broadcast in real time. And this makes double spending detection very easy. We just uh, uh, make sure whenever we accept a payment that the, uh, the source of the funds for, the, for this payment hasn't been used before. And then we broadcast that payment to make sure that others will know that it's already spent. The specifics of this and the assumptions under which it works are somewhat less trivial. But just by saying this, we already see how inherent it is to publish every detail of every transaction, who paid whom and how much. And that means that we've completely lost privacy. Consumers broadcast their purchases, merchants broadcast their cash flow, um, account balances are revealed, not something that we would accept um, in uh, a, a regular payment scheme, a regular currency, but uh, with Bitcoin, it has so many other advantages that this uh, seems to have gone uh, unappreciated for a while. Now, uh, those familiar with Bitcoin should object and say that uh, it's not people's names that's written there, it's only pseudonyms or keys that they can invent. But um, in practice, most users, especially those that have nothing to uh, hide, uh, use few addresses and therefore are easy to track. And there are numerous works showing how the, the transaction graph can be analyzed to extract information. It's also a risk to the fungibility of the currency, the fact, the fact that coins can be distinguished and their history can be told. Thank you for the introduction and for the honor of uh, inviting me here to tell you about research that my colleagues, I, and many people all over the world have been doing over the past few years tackling some of the pressing realities of uh, information security and the way we build computer systems. Um, let me start with a bit of motivation, but otherwise uh, doom and gloom proclamations that will motivate the later promise of salvation by snarks. Um, so we have numerous threats to our computer systems. Uh, we have bugs, um, we have random failures, the proverbial cosmic rays, Trojan horses. Um, even when we don't, we're not supposed to have this the way things were designed, uh, there are uh, supply chain issues that uh, can induce this along the way. And each of these applies at the level of user software, at the level of the uh, hardware, at the level of the platform software that's in between the hypervisor and operating system even the physical environment surrounding the computer as a physical device. 
Each of these um, has numerous examples uh, for the way it can be exploited. Each of the combination in this Cartesian project has made it to uh, papers, news, and exp exploitation in the real world. And moreover, in the most extreme case, we have scenarios when we're not supposed to trust anyone. We might be in a network on untrusted peers that uh, may be uh, adversarial to us in uh, a game theoretic sense or economical sense or national sense. And um, each of these can uh, compromise the uh, integrity, confidentiality, availability of the information produced on these systems. Just to give uh, one example uh, of a, a a combination of uh, these vectors, the one that we pursue in my lab. Consider the matter of extracting information from a computer using physical leakage. The computer is sitting there, maybe executing algorithms that are perfectly secure to the best of our knowledge, and yet it is a physical device that interacts with the environment by emitting electromagnetic waves, by um, a, changing its power consumption, by creating noises, by changing the electric potential on its ground wires, and so on. And each of these can and has been used for extracting secret keys out of computers. It can be uh, by touch of hand to measure electric potential, or by putting uh, an alligator clip on some uh, grounded wire, uh, it can be just by putting a sticker under someone's cell phone and measuring the electromagnetic emanations from its voltage regulator, acoustic emanations measured from across a classroom using a microphone, observing the vibrations of capacitors as some cryptographic operation is running. And uh, conveniently, even uh, small semi-edible implements, that, this, that is a piece of pita bread, that can be used to measure electromagnetic waves and extract secret keys. And when I say extract secret keys, um, well, you may recognize some of these logos. This, uh, these are some of the systems that we successfully attacked. Com very common software, very common hardware, algorithms such as RSA, elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman, El-Gamal, elliptic curve DSA, all of these have been broken by these means. And this is just one research group and its collaborators. So there's a, there are th thousands of papers showing how more can be done. Switching over to uh, integrity, well, in this case, let me appeal to the popular media that tells us how uh, even the uh, United States Department of Defense cannot fully verify the hardware that it's using to run its critical computations, for example, in the field. And uh, of course, it goes both ways. Uh, we know that the NSA is retaining the favor by uh, adding features to um, by sending them a proof of that claim that is short and easy to verify. Pictorially, we have a prover and a verifier. There is some computational claim expressed as the claim that some specific function run on some specific input and some additional witness input ex outputs some output Y. The claim is that there exists such a witness for which this holds. And instead of just trusting that the claim is true, Snarks let you produce proofs of its, of its truth. Now, we could go both way, two ways. We could uh, drill down into the formalities of these statements. Or we can uh, just uh, show a definition by example, motivating each of these properties. And that's the track that we'll choose today. So I'm going to motivate the study of Snarks by uh, a system called zero cash. Decentralized anonymous payments from bitcoins. Uh, and um, some of you may be aware of it and may also be aware that it's currently being uh, commercialized and deployed. They may be wondering, am I plugging my uh, stake in uh, some company? Well, it's the other way around. The reason that uh, deployment is happening in the first place is that zero cash is a wonderful example of, of the power of snarks, what they're good for, and the properties uh, that uh, are, uh, make them most pertinent to applications. So let's drill in. Um, just to uh, uh, avoid any shade of doubt uh, or shadow of doubt, I will uh, uh, stay consistent to the original academic paper 
So for those who are familiar with Zcash, the digital currency, um, I will use different notation and simplified constructions. So um, Bitcoin's privacy problem. Uh, I guess everyone here is familiar with Bitcoin, but um, how many of you are aware that whenever you use Bitcoin, you are essentially broadcasting your transactions everywhere? Okay, about a fourth of the uh, shipments and route to their customers. So how can we ever trust something that comes out of the computer when this is the reality that we face? How do we know that it hasn't leaked? How do we know that it is correct? So taking a step back, we have a great challenge here. And the traditional ways to cope with it are essentially to be very careful. Be uh, very sure about where you buy your hardware, where you subcontract your software, Make sure that everything is carefully certified and, of course, bear the expense of that, which is unbearable. So even the uh, NSA, I am told, no longer maintains its old fab. It can no longer produce its old chip. chips. So what, what are uh, small companies supposed to do? What are the citizens supposed to do to protect their information? And what are we all supposed to do in those adversarial environments of network protocols? So I want to make a case uh, that uh, modern cryptography offers us wonderful tools to cope with this problem. Ways by which instead of certifying every component, we can just use the uh, magic of modern cryptography um, to um, somehow get the properties we want a posteriori. And this includes both general tools and theory, studying where um, we can apply these techniques, such techniques, when do they even make sense, when they are possible in principle and underworld assumptions, and applications to uh, specific uh, cases where the things are, uh, have a need and uh, e efficient enough for execution. And in this talk, I will focus on the latter for the case of verifying computation. Now, the primitive we will discuss, the pr cryptographic primitive, is called uh, SNARK for succinct non-interactive argument of knowledge. And we will dwell on the acronym in a bit, but uh, first, very informally, this uh, is a way to um, convince an untrusting party of a computational claim. Uh, 